Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? I'm good. The last time we talked was before I risked arrest and got arrested. And now, like, I really feel like a much deeper connection to you, right? So you were a huge part of inspiring me to do that. So I just wanted to oh, thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. It really does feel incredible. That's It just feels so liberating and so, like, the right thing to do to me. Speaking of your arrest, and we just had so many scientists arrested recently and also enormous number of healthcare workers come out just now with XR in London, which has been super powerful. We've had police officers in tears being forced to wow. arrest doctors. That's um, amazing. In order to clear a bridge. Wow. And a healthcare worker who called a friend of mine yesterday evening and said that they could see the officer in the interview room shaking whilst they were interrogating them, asking them questions. You know, that's extremely powerful. And I guess following on from a conversation that I just facilitated between a theologian and an anthropologist, which was very beautiful, a kind of meditation or an interrogation of courage, I guess, I sort of wanted to ask you to just speak to the movement at this moment about courage and what it means, uh, what it is, what kind of courage do we need, that kind of thing. And perhaps you want to reflect on your experience of arrest first. If you can make this not about yourself and just make it about the earth and um, just see yourself as kind of a vessel for this message, which you know so deeply is correct, to stand up for life on this earth and to stop what's happening right now to the planet. That's what gives me the courage to do it. And I think that's what gives a lot of people the courage to do it too. This is something like the damage that's being done on the earth is going to reverberate through earth's geological history for millions of years. So it's, it's like irreversible. We're talking about the permanent degradation to, to humanity's collective future. It's people that haven't even arrived on the planet yet, right? Future generations. You, I, I think, you know, as a father thinking about my kids, you know, and doing this for them, that gives me great courage. All of this, uh, making it about other beings and the earth itself, you kind of become very calm, I think, and fearless. You know, that's what I would encourage people to try to go for. So I don't know what it, how it works for you, Claire. Does that, do, do you kind of feel the same way about courage or is it different? Well, I've been thinking a lot about the word courage and the last conversation that I had about it was also reflecting on the fact that it contains the word cur, which was heart. Yeah. You sounded like you were about to sort of speak a little bit about a practice that helps you, but in terms of the sort of the openness of, of the heart and the resilience That's of the right. heart. I, I think it'd be cool if you want to say something about so that. So everything that I was talking about, it, that's exactly right. It's all about just like an expression of love, right? So when you express love, that's not about you. Like that's, that's something that like just like an energy that you're putting out into the world without expecting anything in return. Um, and, and that's what's so powerful about it, right? Um, so it's so so true love is basically a dissolution of the ego because um, it's 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 just this, like you said, this open thing. There's the barrier between you and the thing that you're expressing love for, which can be the entire universe, basically. That that barrier, the illusion of separation completely dissolves, right? And so you feel the truth, which is that you are like literally connected to. Every, everything, like all other people, all other beings. I, I don't know how to say this without sounding kind of weird, but we're just atoms and energy, right? Which is all, all through the universe. And it comes together into this form that's Claire or this form that's Peter for a few years, right? And then it dissolves and goes into other stuff. So you're literally like a collection of these atoms that used to be other beings on this planet, right? And you're exchanging Car literally exchanging carbon by breathing, eating food, incorporating that in your body, breathing it out. It goes into trees, it turns into fruit, you eat it again. Like, and like there's this cycling going on, which has a time frame of a few years, right? And so we're literally connected at the atomic level with, with everyone. And so the practice that I do is a, is a kind of meditation where I kind of try to be in touch with my body sensations. And so you can experience uh, impermanence like directly in your own body <laughs> so the like thoughts come up right you don't really control them they just come up they disappear so you got this constant changing in your mind and you you can also feel 
that everywhere in your whole body, there's sensation all the time, just these, these vibrating kind of sensations that come and go. So you realize there's like nothing really solid there to, to hold on to. Um, and that helps like take away this illusion that we, we're so like a billionaire is a billionaire because they are so grasping and attached to the self and they just want to bring everything into the self, right? And get more and more. They, they kind of want to own everything, right? That's this kind of like, sort of like ultimate expression of ego, I think that is manifested in sort of these people who are almost trillionaires. And the, the alternative to that is to be kind of more like a tree, right? <laughs> um, which is just, it just does its thing, it exists, it's like always giving, and it's just connected, right, to, to all the other trees, to the soil, to the air, to the earth, to the rain, to the sun. Imagine how powerful it would be if we had like literally millions of people around the world risking civil disobedience to stop the destruction of this beautiful planet that gives us all life. Can you imagine how powerful that would be? And then the other thing that's really important is that taking part in actions like this and taking some risks, it's the best bomb for climate despair and, and this feeling of overwhelm that so many people are feeling well right now. You know, you can do like sort of traditional climate activism, which honestly, you know, it's sort of like maybe gotten us to this point along with the climate disasters, but it really hasn't caused a step change in society yet. By the way, I think we have to get out of this like net zero by 2050, no more gas cars by 2035. This kind of like really slow incremental thinking is going to basically get us all killed. <laughs> so um, we have to switch as a society to what I call emergency mode and just go basically as fast as we can and come together as the nations of the world too. like stop all this like stupid fighting and warfare and it's just so idiotic we've got to come together as a species and make um literally saving this planet our you know only home our top priority and so when once you take part in an action like this you feel this like wonderful sense of solidarity and kind of connection like a feeling that you're you're doing something that is at the right scale writing a letter to the editor uh, it might get published. That's great. But we're on the verge of degradation of all life on earth, right? And like the sixth mass extinction. Writing a letter to the editor, is it's good. It's better than nothing, but it's not, it doesn't rise to the scale of what's at stake here. But civil disobedience does. And um, people who feel despair and people who feel overwhelmed, I just urge them to do soul searching and to seriously consider taking actions like this, because I think that they will find that it is the best possible thing they could do for their mental health. Well, so there's two things I want to say about that. One is that sometimes I think people think that because we describe this work as a catharsis, that it somehow still relates to something quite ego-driven or quite like, you know, about the self. And I guess my experience of it, and I think what you're saying as well, is that it's actually the letting go of control of right. putting yourself in a certain amount of risk. And of, uncertainty too. Yeah. It's a, it's a leap into the unknown. Yeah. And, and I think there's something about that which helps in a way to let go of some of yourself. And it's acting for something bigger than you. And in that way, I think it can be a bit of a relief from the ego, from the self. And so you might describe that as, as, as a catharsis and people think, well, that's, that's you getting something for it. When in fact, you're delivering yourself into the work in some sense in a sacrificial way and at the same time for me anyway it, it feels like there can be a bit of a letting go and a bit of a becoming of like becoming who you really are I always say when I was working in fashion that it was like contorting myself in many ways to be able to just do something that I didn't really agree with in order to pay my rent there's a great sort of psychological and psychic pain and amount of energy and effort that's required just to just to keep the wheels turning of business as usual and the release of being able to go no I'm actually going to obstruct that today and it's proven now by medical professionals not just activists saying it that it's that it's tremendous for your mental well-being so I think that it's more the thing that's more kind of selfish is when you make excuses for why you're not going to take part in these kinds of actions because it's really easy to to make excuses 
And, and that comes from a place of fear, which is this kind of like kind of closing in to yourself. The social norms that are leading us directly to planetary catastrophe that, you know, protect the fossil fuel industry, they're so strong that they kind of trap us like a cage like that. And you know deep down inside that something's wrong, but you don't have, say, the courage to kind of challenge those norms directly. Then that's where that feeling of kind of overwhelm sort of comes from, right? Because you feel powerless. You feel like trapped by these social norms. Yeah, I don't, I, I think to make that leap, you, you do have to let go of yourself and you're, you're sort of acting in harmony with all the other beings on the earth, like the, the ones that don't have a voice, like the coral reefs and, uh, and future generations and the forests that are burning and dying um, from drought. So you're starting to, to kind of connect with all that energy and you're defending that and you're speaking for that and you're like deeply connected to that. It's like, it's like a form, it's like the, a very deep form of gratitude to the, to the earth and to the biosphere for just being alive, right? It's, you could almost say it's like paying, paying your rent, I guess, to the earth or like giving back. The earth creates you, you have this life. It's like, what are you gonna do with it? Like, are you gonna like kind of give back to the planet that created you and sort of defend the planet in its time of need? Yeah, it sounds a little bit as well, like what you're describing is like a reciprocity kind of situation, right? Where you're getting back because of what you give and you fall into some sort of balance with things. And, it, and it's very strange, I think, that we live in a society where you have to go and break rules in order to feel that. I think that's Again, what the, I find very heartbreaking. Break, breaking the rules, it, it's because the, those rules are the, the kind of solidification of all of these social norms. Again, and this capitalist society that we live in, which is taking us literally to the brink of planetary destruction, which is what I think, you know, maybe roughly half of the population doesn't really understand what an emergency this is, right? The other half gets it, but they tune it out because they're they're so afraid of it, right? That's why you have to challenge those social norms at this at this moment, because otherwise they're not going to change, right? Um, it's really clear that the power structures aren't going to change those norms voluntarily because they would have to relinquish power and they would have to redistribute wealth in order to do it. Again, like the human mind is very very good at self justification, so those people in power. They, they find ways to tell themselves that what they're doing is like the best path. And it's not, it's clearly not. I mean, as an earth scientist, you see all these plots of the CO2 rising and you see all these plots of the temperature rising, the ice melting and the precipitation changing and the sea level rising. And it's, it's fucking insane. Spring coming sooner, uh, you know, animals and plants moving towards the poles. The list goes on and on. It's really happening. And it's happening because of colonialist extractive capitalism, which is run on fossil fuels. And to come out of it was going to take a massive redistribu redistribution and sort of like relocalization of, of energy structures and food structures and wealth, right? You can't have trillionaires. T trillionaires are just on the other side of the coin of earth breakdown, right? It's clear that they're not going to voluntarily make this change. So it's up to us now if we want to have a livable planet. And we don't want to, in 10 years, feel a deep sense of regret that we didn't do everything we could when we had this moment. We have to act now in this moment. And that means pushing against those norms. The other thing I wanted to say is that um, this is kind of what the Buddhists have been saying for over 2,000 years, um, that suffering comes from attachment. Suffering comes from being like attached to this sense of self, like this body, this mind. And this phenomenon, which, like I said before, it's just this constantly changing thing. Um, you know, you get pleasant sensations and you want more of them. You get uh, painful sensations and you want them to go away. And that attachment to, to those sensations and to this self is the ultimate source of suffering, essentially. So civil disobedience is one practice that can help dissolve that. Um, you're, you're, you're kind of becoming less attached to, to self. And that's why I think it feels so good. It's it's not that you're selfishly like getting something. Um, it's that you're, you're you're starting to relinquish those attachments and just that very act of like being less attached and being like in tune with everything else outside of you. That is why I think the suffering uh, gets reduced.
I completely agree. But it's also a little bit scary, isn't it, sometimes? And so I wonder if you can say something concrete about like your experience the other day, because it looked from the pictures like they sent 200 riot cops to come and deal with a couple of scientists chained to a door. We were not like violently treated by the cops. But the thing that did make me afraid was the possibility of losing my job and just being like criticized by society, right? Both of those things are the, the ego and the attachment, right? So when you're afraid of what other people think, of what you're doing and of their criticism. Um, that's again, the same kind of closing off and like sort of being imprisoned by these social norms. If you can resonate with that connection and come out of that attachment to like, oh, how is this gonna affect me, right? You know that there's all these forces out there that don't want you to be doing this, but you're okay with it. You're like, you're like it's just what I gotta do. <laughs> I, I am who I am. This is what I got to do. And I hope everyone joins me who looks into their soul and, and can deal with this risk. Our action too was like a pretty, ultimately like a pretty, pretty modest form of civil disobedience, right? We just chained ourselves to door handles in Los Angeles. There's activists in the global South and indigenous activists who are literally getting murdered by fossil fuel corporations trying to defend their land. People who have the privilege to be able to do civil disobedience that, you know, you're, you're not risking that level of a punishment, like ultimately death. Um, those people especially, I think, have a responsibility to step up and take actions. So I hope that makes yeah. sense. Um, I really kind of buried my soul there into, into what I've been thinking and feeling the last few days. Um, so, so I hope that's okay. Um, it's totally okay, Peter. I really appreciate it. It's really nice to like speak to somebody who can sort of open themselves up so much and it feels like the power of your vulnerability is very useful, I think, for people to bear witness to. I know we've both got to go in a second, but I just wanted to ask before we do um, close, if you've got any words that you'd like to say about our friend Emma Smart, who's a fellow scientist and ecologist. She's currently on a nil by mouth hunger strike in Charing Cross police station. She, similar to you, took a very minor act of civil disobedience. On Wednesday, she glued her hand to the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. That action caused a bit of an, out, a bit of an outcry from our business secretary in this country, suggesting basically that we were all stupid and we must continue fossil fuel extraction in the British North Sea. My heart goes out to Emma. I mean, she's she's in the next level of kind of risk. And, um, you know, I'm grateful for what she's doing. And I hope that the world starts to support her. So the best way to support Emma is to start taking civil disobedience actions yourself. Because as more and more of us start to take these sorts of actions, the risk for all of us starts to decrease to the governments that are imprisoning Emma and that are trying to shut down this kind of protest. I mean, you're on the wrong side of history and um, it's absolutely clear now. The scientists of the world in their formal language in a report have made that clear. The Secretary General of the United Nations has made that clear. And um, it's, it's just, it, this is the time. I mean, I don't know how else to say this. Like the time is not next year, the time is not five years from now. Time is not 10 years from now. The time is right now to start engaging in um, climate disobedience and, uh, you know, sort of, I guess, answering to a higher law, which is the law of life. It breaks my heart that we're at this point in a society. I don't want to uh, get people in trouble. I, I want people to come out of suffering. I want all beings to come out of suffering, but I just, I don't, I think to not say what I'm saying right now will cause far more suffering and death in the future than saying what and, and acting this way. There's this old joke, right? The best way to thank a climate activist is to become a climate activist. And the best way to thank someone who is taking this kind of risk like Emma is taking now uh, is uh, to also start taking risks. And again, like I think climate activism that's successful at this point, it's got to feel a little risky. Petitions and marches, I'm so grateful for everyone who's participated in those, but as a tactic from where I'm sitting, I don't see them having a profound effect on the systems of power, but I do see civil disobedience having a pro profound effect. And especially as it starts to 
multiply, right? So, so this is the time to not leave the few people who are engaging and taking these risks hanging. Don't leave them hanging. Support them by stepping up. So I, I hope that plants a seed in, in some people. I know it's a really hard thing um, and it can take a long time to sort of make your peace with that and to, and to come into the movement like this. But I urge people to start that work, in, uh, that internal work that they, that they need to do to come into this movement and to start taking those risks and to step things up. Thanks so much for your openness. And yeah. thanks so much for your work. Thank you for all of your inspiring work, Claire. And um, you too. yeah, talk to you again on the, the other flip side, I guess, whatever that is. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you so much. Bye. Yeah. Bye.